Welcome to New Mexico Black Rifle Operators Union. I'm your host, Sean. So, the first thing I wanted to talk about was the governor of New Mexico. She gave the state of the state address, is what she calls it. In that, she lays out her priorities. In that priority, my suspicions were confirmed that the gun agenda was definitely a governor's call. What she laid out, though was this huge laundry list of things she's wanting to do in New Mexico. And some of them, most, well, most of them, a lot of citizens would support. Uh, Number one, she wants to increase and help the economy. Uh, She talks about funding for K-12 schools, uh, for infrastructure. Those are going to be her big fights, I think. Um, If she doesn't get any of these, then it will progress down the list. And the last thing I saw on there, including she did a lot of stuff for safety, um, specifically about increasing penalties for, not necessarily for guns, but more so for crime. So it looks like she's trying to reverse some of the stuff they have pushed in the past. I applaud her for that. I give credit where credit's due. I still hate the lady. I still think she's evil. Um, she's affected New Mexico in ways that we will take decades to recover from. Um, But on to the cool stuff, because, well, cool stuff is what I like to focus on. At SHOT Show, since I'm not an insider, an industry insider, like most of us, I have to rely on what people that are industry insiders that get to go to this trade show to see what's there. Now, I've been to that exact conference center, and as big as they like to make SHOT Show out, it is not the biggest show that I've been to there. Uh, The biggest show there that I went to there multiple times was Cisco Live, and it was one of the biggest ones they ever had. So uh, it's cool, but in that parlance, what it is, they're actually in the same convention center that uh, the WAS is in, uh, the World of Solutions. Um, if you're a Cisco or an IT guy like I am. That's just geek talk for me. The first thing I wanted to cover, um, because uh, from SHOT Show, that is, was that I saw the coolest thing to me there so far. Uh, yesterday was released, and it was released later in the day. There's going to be a new brand called Battlefield Brand, or Battlefield, from PSA. And one of their first offerings, which shocked me to no end is an STG-44. Now, there are rumors around this. Uh, The Gun Collective covered it. He's a pretty cool cat. He's also a legal guy, too. Um, But what was interesting about the PSA STG-44, and there was another company that covered this, too, so I'm stealing other people's work. Understand that. Not stealing, reporting on other people's work um, because I don't have access to the industry itself yet. I'm working on that. (laughs) Um... But the STG-44 that they're bringing out, the mortar, the rumors around this are that it is going to be 5.56, 762 by 39 And there's, they're saying that they won't be making it in 8mm quartz, but then there's also publishing that says they will. So why is this cool? Is This gives me and most end users of the firearms that we love or people in the 2A community, this gives us a chance to actually shoot an STG-44 um, probably because if PSA puts it out, it means it's going to be priced in a working man. He may have to work a little bit harder because there, this thing can't be cheap to make. Um, from what I've heard or seen already, it looks like it has a lot of the stylings and features that the uh, HMS version did that never it turned out to be vaporware. Why do I see this being cool? is it shows that the guy that runs PSA, the guys that run it, are out for their customers. Weeks back, I had seen on a PSA forum, on Facebook no less, them talking about, you should bring the STG44 to the market. Now for me, knowing the history of what it takes to pull a gun out of the world, out of the air, you have to have the tool packet, the data packet, and you have to have examples, lots of examples, if you don't have those, so you can tear them apart and get dimensions and stuff for manufacturing it, right? Because you're basically backwards engineering 
the gun that the Germans made in, you know, 50 or 70 plus years ago. And to try to replicate that, even in a modern guise, is a big deal. It's usually financially burdensome. Palmetto Stair Armory has the resources. This is one of the reasons why I'm a huge fan. Is there one of their bylines? I've said this multiple times. Is to maximize freedom, but this brings something to the market that number one, I don't think anybody thought would ever happen. Um, HMS gave us a glimmer of hope, and then it went away because it became too financially burdensome to manufacture this. But PSA has the chops and they have the resources. If they want to make this thing fly, they'll make it fly because they're trying to help their customers, trying to maximize freedom. And they found they have the expertise all under one roof to probably figure this out in a way better way than I'm thinking. But in the past, historically, when you get something without a data packet or without the tooling a packet or without both because that's what would happen since the the designers the people that made this don't exist they were pretty much destroyed after world war ii so for them to go hot and heavy that's pretty cool why is this significant in the 2a community there's a lot of people that make replicas that end up going out going away and that's okay um what is more impressive is that this will come to the market. They've already shown it. They already have a, a brand associated with this. So maybe we'll see the SVD-40 um, or SVT or whatever the hell it is. The Russian talker off semi-automatic answer to the M1 Grand. Maybe we'll see a new M1 Grand. Maybe we will see some bolt guns. I don't see PSA doing that. I see them looking more at like a semi-automatic version of the MP40. Sorry about that. There's a game that keeps alerting me even though I turned off everything. With the next thing I saw that was really cool. Midwest, I'm an AK guy. Always have been, probably always will be. That said, I've also said uh, if the ball drops, I'll probably grab my AR-15 or my 5.56 AK because of the caliber. And more so because if I need to support something, I could get support. I have the parts to support both those rifles. And I have the magazines to support them. But the ammunition source is a big thing in the United States. Um, Midwest Industries is doing an alpha set of accessories. So I don't see that they're going to sell the complete completed gun. But they're selling the forens, the uh, all the furniture sets that when, Jane, when Vickers... I think his name's James Vickers. He did... A series on the Russian Alpha. The Russian Alpha is an AK that's a slightly more compact version. It's made for kind of like CQ CQB. Um, the Alphas usually are 545. Um, there are a few that I know that exist in 762 by 39. Um, the 762 30 by 39 is probably a better version and a shorter rifle. And the reason why that is is because it'll get it holds more of its ballistic potential. So I'm excited about seeing. Uh, alpha accessories other than from Zenit Co. made in the USA. That's kind of kick butt for an AK guy. Um, Aero Precision is releasing or re-releasing their Precision Bolt Action Rifle. And I believe they call it the System X. Now it has a, a chassis like a lot of other Precision rifles. But Aero Precision has been known for making very precise AR-15s for them to do this they're looking at stretching their legs for long range shooting and to give what customers want that adjustable universal chassis where you can put accessories on it that you need for long range shooting to be more precise um, and to give you a consistent product and a consistent way of manufacturing that Kyber Customs uh, this I'm mentioning because it's a deal. Um, Kyber Customs right now during SHOT Show is offering free shipping on any of their stuff. That's kind of cool. Um, there's a lot of buzz, and I mentioned this yes on yesterday's podcast, about the 5.7 MMP uh, line of pistols. 
Um, a lot of people are talking about the 5.7 again. This Smith & Wesson entering into this field is a good thing for the industry. It's a good thing for shooters because 5.7 is cost prohibitive right now. If a huge manufacturer like MMP is going to start producing um, a shield or a, an MMP line of pistol in a 5.7, that means they see some market for that um, caliber. Now, Ruger has already there, been there. PSA has been already been there. And FN is the one that started that whole thing. So Beretta is releasing the new Cheetah 80X. I think it's they call yeah, the 80X. It's a modernized version of the original Cheetah. Um, so it's a 380 double stack. I would say subcompact, but not quite. It's in that hybrid space. If you're looking for a smooth shooting 380, this may be something you'd look for. I would be, this also has optics cuts or options for optics cuts. If you're looking for optics for a 380, uh, a red dot specifically. I don't understand the red dots. I still don't. And that's because, I, I mean, yes, you probably get faster times. I've shot them uh, on pistols. It's just not something I see a lot of value in. I never have. I'm not, I'm not going to be one of those guys that spends a lot of money for a uh, RMR cut uh, pistol. Because, yeah, I see the value of what you're talking about. And if I was shooting a race gun, that's great. And my everyday concealed carry guns, if I have a light on it, like I do on my Glock 26, I want the only battery on it that I want is for that light. I don't want to have to check batteries for the sight system, one of the key components that you need in a fight. So that's cool. They're doing a lot of other things to make it to modernize the Cheetah. It looks great. I've heard nothing about awesome about the Cheetah. Maybe I need to pick one of the surplus versions up just to see what it's like before I ever consider getting the 380. I like the 380 caliber. Ruger is now going to release the lever guns in all kinds of guises. And I think this is where Ruger could shine and really blow competitors away right now because there is a demand from myself and from a lot of us in the shooting community for that nostalgia of having a lever gun. Some of us have had lever guns. I have only got to shoot them. I've never owned a lever gun. But there's a nostalgia around this is probably one of your first deer hunting rifles or hunting rifles you were ever exposed to. Or maybe it was even your first rifle you were ever exposed to. Ruger's going to cap, yeah, capitalize on that. Um, okay, so this is a cool one that I, I think it's a cool accessory. The IPSC store or SBRE Speed PC Versa Pouch. Now what this is, is a John Wick pouch. Um, stick to the company IPC and you'll find this. Um, they have a pouch that would be put on like your battle belt, but for pistol caliber carbine specific type magazines. That means that it looks like they are going to have them for the extended, or not extended, normal capacity 30 uh, Glock, 30 round Glock magazines for uh, the majority of the PCCs that I've seen. Um, that also means like SIG or Beretta, any of those guys that have made extended magazines and not extended standard capacity makes. I'm trying to wean myself off of extended. Um, when I say extended, I say that it's bigger than the magazine will, not the capacity. I don't actually care about the capacity. I think the capacity, whether you have one round or, you know, 100, it doesn't matter. Um, if you're a poor shooter, it doesn't matter, but it also doesn't matter anyway because, well, we're in the United States, and that's fine. On the other, there are tons. I watched this stuff all day after the podcast yesterday and after I got some business stuff taken care of. I looked at FN. FN's re-releasing a hammer-fired pistol. Um, I don't know why. There's a lot of buzz around metal frame pistols there, uh, specifically like the Smith & Wesson that was released, I think, last year or, or something like that. Um, I think Canik's even doing it now. 
Um, speaking of Canik, Canik has released a new, uh, well, they've had this line out. They call it the Meat line, M-E-T-E. And it's kind of in that fun 365 size. So it's great for concealed carry, but it's a lot cheaper at 400 bucks or 460 bucks MSRP. So you'll probably find them 350 somewhere around there. Uh, that's an interesting thing. Lots of buzz around. Oh, the other thing FN did that was different was they're making uh, the scar in a pistol. Um, the pistol buzz for the, the scar would be great. I don't understand the caliber selection FN chose. They chose 5.56. Five, and anytime you short the barrel of a 5.56, five, you're shorting the ballistic potential. It is a. 5.56 is one of those rounds that has to have the velocity and maintain its velocity to be effective for what it's designed to do. I've seen tons of silencers, but what was in first one I, that piqued my interest is uh, PTR, because I like PTR, that's why it piqued my interest. The first time I saw this headline, I, I thought they were going to make like the HK-33, Instead, what I found out was they're making a suppressor for 5.56s. Kind of cool. There's lots of buzz around uh, Gym Tech and Silencer Co. Silencer Co. I think is releasing an Inconel 3D printed in uh, where the insert itself, where all the baffles are 3D printed from Inconel. And it is pretty impressive. If you don't know what Inconel is, it's a hard metal or sufficiently malleable metal for the gun industry, but it's very good at dissipating heat or dealing with how the stresses of heat. So it makes a lot of sense for Silencer Co. to look at that to give you a long-lasting product that, you know, you're already paying a tax stamp for. Uh, but what I was impressed with with this is you're seeing suppressors, you're seeing accessories come out for shorter type devices, guns. That means the industry thinks that they have enough push to keep this going and they see enough market share for this that they're willing to push that. Um, Walther. I like Walther. I've shot a few Walthers. I still want a Walther PPK just because of James Bond, but they re-released -re the Slim PD, uh, PDP F. And a lot of people say this is for our females. That's what the F is. Okay, great. But what they did was they slimmed the grip down on it. And if you've ever shot a Walther, well, one thing you'll notice is the trigger on the new Walthers is amazing. So much so that's how Canik copied theirs. Theirs is a copy of, I think, the 99, uh, that one of their 99 series pistols. Primary Arms, my favorite optic company released their ACSS Nova Optic, uh, or Reticle. Now, why do I like Primary Arms? Great price point. You get what you, you get a lot of value for what you pay. A working man gets access to stuff like the Trigicon. You get the warranty and support along with that. But I like Vortex too. Vortex is an American company. Uh, primary Arms, sometimes I've heard, uses Chinese or, or not Chinese, Japanese um, optics or glass. And that's fine. Um, Japan is always going to be an ally. China isn't. And China isn't known for making the best stuff. Of course, one, our, one of our favorite gun, or, uh, gun organizations is there. And I didn't see FPC, but I'm sure they're there too. But G... OA is there at a booth. That's cool. They're always behind us. Um, that's why I support them. Takaroff USA. I didn't even know this was a thing. So I'm still researching more about this. If you don't know what Takaroff is, Takaroff is a company that they're, well, not a company, it was a manufacturer in Russia that made pistols, specifically the 762 by 25 Takarov, um, but they also made the 9mm Makarovs. They made a lot of early rifles in the Russian parlance, and uh, that was accepted. I believe they even made some of the 
uh, light machine guns. So I'm curious to what they're bringing to the American market. And I'm sure it's an American company that may have ties to Russia, but probably is all American that is just starting or getting their way into the world to see what kind of awesome they can do. From SIG, I have only seen a few things from SIG. The one that piqued my interest only because I was like, okay, it's pretty. Um, It's a good looking gun because it's different. Um, they're releasing the SIG P365 in 9mm and 380 in four women with a rose gold type accents. Now, I, it, why I say it's pretty, it's different. I don't see, I've never been a huge fan of rose gold, but it's different to see on a firearms accessory and it makes it pop a lot more. But this came with a six. Uh, a vault and a package of training and a ton of other stuff to try to get females to shoot more. The problem I have with this is the sticker price, $965. That's kind of a deal breaker for most people, especially women that are brand new to the shooting world who were, when they see the prices of things, that's going to give them sticker shock. Doesn't matter how great the gun is. $965 seems a little high. Um, But, I don't know what the value is of those accessories are. Um, Having a a vault, uh, when I say a vault, a personal storage device that you can put next to your bed, locked down, and it's locked and secure. This is a big thing with female shooters because they're worried about their kids or somebody getting their gun. So while it may be on their person, they're at night when they go to bed, they want to put it away so that their kids can't just find it and go do stupid stuff. Kind of what we all should be doing. However, I don't do that. I, um, I've i trained my kids from a very, very young age. The dad's always got a gun on him. Um, <laughs> now that I'm not working for K-12 schools, that's even more a thing. So these are the preliminary things, and there's tons more. There's tons of stuff about silencers, from silencers everywhere. So... I'm hoping that that's a good sign that the industry sees that that there's going to be some sort of watermark change with the press that they see. It also looks like they must have some inside ball, and I hope so. That means that there's some good guys in in the government still that are looking out for the average citizen. Um... I don't... I still don't believe the pistol brace stuff will pass, um constitutional muster at the supreme court level it sucks that we have to go this far every time to keep our rights and in new mexico we're really having to fight this fight to get back to what the governor said how i see this playing out she's going to go down the list of her items in the state of the state address and if she gets all of her big wins then she's going to focus on guns okay If she doesn't get any of her big wins, this is how we win for the 2A. What I mean is you make those other meetings, and this is where the reps do our work for us, so long, so intensive. This is a long session, so this is a normal session, so it's 60 days, started yesterday. So we have 60 days in New Mexico to make our voice heard, talk to your reps, Get them involved. Uh, In northwest New Mexico, Ryan Lane has already came out and said, yeah, I don't see this getting to the floor because we have so many other things to deal with. Um, Rod Montoya, who's also the representative of northwest New Mexico, I've got to meet the man at a grocery store a couple of times. Dude is awesome. He's very approachable, especially to his constituents. He hates our governor, <laughs> and with, with no unabashed. I, I say that because not saying you could read between the lines. You could see the contempt, contempt that this lady showed him, and he is just reflecting it. And with that, I think he'll fight for his citizens' rights. He knows what we want in northwest New Mexico. When I talk to him, I talked to him once during the COVID crap when I was still working for K-12 and was – complying to try to be an idiot, I guess is the best way to put it. I was an idiot working for K-12s in that I complied. 
with the COVID stuff because I had still been married to a career that is now a thing of the past. Um, I thought I was helping kids in the best way I could by making sure they had access to technology and that I made it scalable and work forever with these guys, um, that we could replace pieces or add pieces and there wouldn't be any fallout from or minimize the fallout from that. Tried to be flexible to adapt to their learning models as they evolved and they kept evolving. I think that's a great thing. So that's what I thought it was. But in that, I got my shots because of peer pressure around me. You work around a group of people. You kind of, they can become family. I could have literally rolled it in the cone and told them no because most of my people in my department did. Um, the rest of them were influenced by my decision because if I was willing to do it or they had family that was really, really on that edge of being, you know, they were immunocompromised. They were trying to protect their family because their family's just as big of a deal. Those may have complied in my department. The rest of them firmly would have told them no. And my people, I had to calm them down before we got the new superintendent um, because they were ready to walk. They were ready to say, no, we're done. We're not doing this. Okay. I helped calm that down. I probably shouldn't have. I probably should have let them speak their mind because maybe if they got more pushback from the whole department, maybe they would have stopped that stuff. That was a big factor in the change in my mindset that you cannot comply your way out of an uncomfortable situation. The only way you do it is by having reasoned arguments, by being non, well, peaceful non-compliance. Just no, I'm not doing that. That's the best way to do this. You don't want to go fight because violence will only bring the violence of the state down on us. When we go to protest, because I'm sure there's going to be a 2A protest, and when I hear about it, I'll let you know because I will probably be heading down there some way. I don't know how I'll afford it right now as I'm trying to grift and grind and keep things afloat until I get my payout from my retirement so I can start my other business. But I will be down there, and I'll broadcast live from that event. What needs to happen when we're there? We need to be present. We need to be vocal. We need to have reasoned arguments. And we need to bring the memes, honestly. Um, let's make our governor feel uncomfortable by the facts of what she's done and make the populace of New Mexico realize how stupid it was to reelect her because of the failures, how many businesses did we lose in New Mexico because of the lockdowns? She still has those emergency powers. That's one of the fights I know they're going to take to her. Um, how many people, how, much, how far behind are those kids I worked so hard to protect to do what I did? How much progress did they lose in the classroom because of the stupidity of compliance? Not one educator except for one board in the entire state of New Mexico, laid it on the line and said no. The board I used to work under was about to do that, and they were talked down because they wanted compliance so that they could voice displeasure and join a lawsuit, but not actually show enough people doing it. One school did that. If all 80 plus in the in the state of New Mexico said no we're not doing that it wouldn't have happened and that's how the 2A needs to go that's why I keep bringing up the marijuana stuff people just didn't comply now it's legal in New Mexico now it's legal in 20 states that mentality needs to happen in the 2A community um, New Jersey when they passed their magazine bans I think four magazines in the state of New Jersey were turned in. Okay. Bump stocks. I don't know anybody that turned in a bump stock. I don't know anybody that ever mentioned it again until the recent ruling. I still say, don't tell anybody you have it. 
just simply live your life, do your thing. If you are a person that isn't a piece of crap, who isn't starting crap, and who isn't in law enforcement's radar, and you're not shooting at a range all the time, a lot of the laws are never going to apply to you because you're never going to be found out unless you're vocal and you show all your crap everywhere. Now, I'm vocal, but I, I'm trying to skate under the law because I'm probably going to enter a business that's probably not um, very to a conducive, but I'm not doing it myself. I'm having my kids, who are 21 and 22, start this business and all I'm going to be is a guy that's labor, that walks around, hands everything out, does whatever. Uh, that may give you an idea because I keep bringing up this one industry that's now legal in the United, in New Mexico. It's because it's my secret sneaky Pete way of still helping the organizations that I care about. Um, I still care about education. I still see it as a good thing if it's in the right hands. My former boss, um, I can say, and the one before him even, I would say, it was in good hands, but the rest of the staff around him, their peers, have stagnated. And they're dogmatic in their thinking, and they're thinking backwards, not forwards. And while they're trying to push progress on some things that they see that are important, um, the one thing that is the biggest red flag for any parent is equity and inclusion. Because while I believe in equity and inclusion of kids that are on the outside need to be brought in to some degree, I also have a huge, that's a huge red flag to tell me that you're trying to give people a different starting point in life than what everybody else in the same class should be. What I mean if you think about it in a race, you don't give someone a huge head start. You make sure they all line up according to the start of the race and they all go. Then they go at let their drive, their speed, motivate how fast they complete the race. Now, when you when I say that, I understand some people don't have all those opportunities. You want to give them or try to help them get the leg up. But once they've got the leg up, they need to be self-starters. And that's where I think our educational system has stopped. For years, we've produced people that are drones. They do exactly what you tell them. This is why we have such a problem in the 2A and why we have such a problem with NPCs in the world around us. Like, share, subscribe, be great. Please share our podcast, uh, my podcast. Let people see that we're behind the blue line, but we're trying to keep New Mexico tactical, and we are gun people. We always have been. It's three cities in our state that tend to screw us and push us towards the democratic way of life. And I don't say Democrat way of life, Democratic way of life. I should say Democrat, as in the party way of life. Which means they're trying to make us like California and New York. And we are not far off from that. And the only thing that's ever stopped that are the farmers, ranchers, oil hands, gas hands in New Mexico that support this, this entire state with what they do. Be great.